Asia markets are mostly down amid disappointing data from China. India is set to invest billions of dollars into a deep port, hoping to boost its economy. And we look at Germany's economic outlook as experts say it's poised to stagnate this year. Hello, I'm Tabor Aydin with the latest business and finance news here on TRT World. China's economic landscape faced mixed signals in August as the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, rose, missing market expectations. Meanwhile, the Producer Price Index, PPI, fell sharply, reflecting weaker demand. These trends had rippled effects across the Asia-Pacific markets. And as global investors assess these developments, concerns about sustained growth in the region continue to mount. China's CPI rose by 0.6% year-on-year in August, falling short of the expected 0.7%. Core inflation, which excludes food and energy, rose by 0.3%, marking its second consecutive slower rise. Food prices were the main driver, with pork prices surging 16% and vegetable prices climbing more than 21%. Meanwhile, PPI fell by 1.8% year-on-year, more than the estimated 1.4% decline. Oil, coal and fuel industries saw a 3% price drop, reversing July's 4.3% increase. Weak domestic demand and real estate pressures continue to drag producer prices down. Japanese indices fell by around 2%, largely driven by China's softer-than-expected CPI. Investors are closely watching Japan's economic data, including the weaker-than-expected second-quarter GDP growth, which was at 2.9%. The Japanese yen also weakened against the dollar as risk-off sentiments increase. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index lost 1.93%, while the mainland Chinese CSI 300 fell around 1%. Chinese electrical appliance maker Media Group announced a listing of $492 million, million shares, raising up to three and three quarters of a billion dollars. The listing is the largest in Hong Kong in over three years, offering a glimpse of market optimism despite a broader economic concerns. Let's get more on this now with Josh Mahoney, Chief Market Analyst at Scope Markets. Hi there, Josh. Now, how are China's lower than expected inflation numbers affecting investor sentiment across Asia Pacific markets? Well, I would say it's quite difficult to ascertain exactly how much of the move that we're seeing in Asia is coming from that CPI uh, miss, where we saw essentially a 0 0.6 figure on that headline number. Expectation was at 0 0.7, so certainly it points towards floundering demand within uh, the Chinese economy. And more of the same, really, we've become quite accustomed to this uh, uh, lower than expected and lower than target inflation picture out of China, and it really does highlight the state of play for that economy at the time. But certainly if you look across the board, by and large, the weakness that we'd seen off the back of Friday's jobs report over in the US did allude to weakness in Asia as a whole. And therefore, like I said, trying to pick through exactly what is driving this beyond uh, that US-led move is quite difficult here. Now, what role do food prices, particularly pork, play in driving China's inflation trends? Well, it's an interesting one because, you know, we've, of course, got so many different factors that come into play when you're looking at an inflation picture. And this time around, it seems like the upward uh, sort of push is coming from food, in particular pork. Now, pork has been through a bit of a, a bit of a torrid time. We did see not so long ago, say six months ago, there was a talk about this massive overcapacity for pork, which has a, a very heavy weighting within uh, the inflation uh, metric. And so what we did see was we saw that pork flu where they had then had a restocking phase and we saw this massive overcapacity. That was a problem and it drove down inflation. Now we're starting to come out of that and seeing it providing an upward tailwind. So certainly that is beneficial at the moment at, at a time where certainly we're looking for inflation to come back up and, and, and certainly food at the moment, in particular pork, it provides one area uh, that is doing exactly that. And how could China's producer price decline influence global supply chains and consumer costs at this moment? 
Yeah, I mean, look, the PPI number came in at minus 1.8. So, you know, not great, to say the least. And, you know, I guess you look at it and you're talking about, you know, why might this happen and, and what might the impact be? Well, one side of it could be weak demand, and it does highlight the, the domestic picture in China at the moment. And, and globally, certainly at a time where we're talking about a weak US consumer, the possibility of a recession. At the same time, we're talking about a country where it's very price competitive. I mean, if you look at the EV makers, there's all this talk about just constant price wars and Tesla will be able to attest to that. Um, so certainly this is indicative of a weak demand environment, but it's also indicative of a, a an, an area where businesses continue to feel like they have to compete on prices. And that isn't only in China, that's also over in the US where everyone's really trying to provide the consumer with that low cost product as people are really feeling the pinch after a period that has seen a very elevated uh, inflation levels, certainly globally, maybe not necessarily so much in China. All right, Josh Mahoney, Chief Market Analyst at Scope Markets. We'll have to leave it there. Thanks as always. Thank you. <laughs>now a quick look at some of the other top business stories from around the world. Malaysia's unemployment rate fell to 3.3% in July, down from 3.4% a year ago, remaining steady for nine months. The labour force participation rate rose to 70.4% from 70.1% last year. The number of unemployed people reached a four and a half year low, while employment hit a record high of 16.63 million. Saudi Arabia has hit a milestone in its shift away from oil dependency. Non-oil GDP rose by 4.9% year-on-year in the second quarter thanks to efforts to boost the services and manufacturing sectors. However, due to a decline in oil activities, the country's real GDP fell by 0.3% in the second quarter of 2024 compared to the same period last year. The new Beetlejuice Beetlejuice movie has raked in a massive $110 million in its US opening weekend. The long-awaited Tim Burton sequel is the third best opening weekend of the year, only behind Inside Out 2 and Deadpool and Wolverine. The first movie earned just $8 million when it came out in 1988, but later made more than $77 million as a cult classic. And oil prices have risen after a rough week. Brent crude hit over $72 a barrel, bouncing back from last week's 10% drop. The rise follows worries about slowing demand in the US and China. Traders are awaiting reports from OPEC, the Energy Information Administration and the International Energy Agency. These reports will help clarify if oil demand will stay strong. Plenty more to come here on TRT World, including India's multi-billion dollar port and what it means to the country's economy after this short break. Intuitive, inclusive, informative. From the remotest reaches to the teeming metropolises, the world is one click away. TRTWorld.com New technologies are creating fresh opportunities. But those breakthroughs have come with challenges. Innovation is becoming more global and decentralized. How will that transform our world? Next Tech will show you tomorrow's possibilities today. Next Tech on TRT World. has set its sights on building its biggest ever port. The multi-billion dollar Vardavan port project was approved back in June and Prime Minister Narendra Modi hopes it will expand trade with regional partners. Emre Boz has the story. With the new dawn comes a new day in Mumbai and with it new beginnings. India is set to build its largest port 
The Vardhavan port will be located on the coast of the Arabian Sea and become India's 13th major port. It's planned to be operational by 2030 and will feature nine 1,000-metre large container terminals. More than $9.1 billion will be spent on this port. This port will be India's biggest container port and will be one of the largest and most important deep water ports not only in the country but in the world. And for the Indian government, the investment is worth it. The port will be 20 metres deep and have a total capacity of 298 million metric tonnes per annum becoming the top 10 container handling ports in the world. Located on the west of the country, it will also play a vital role in trade in the Arabian Sea, catering to container traffic on the east coast of Africa and the Persian Gulf. And as it becomes an international trading hub, the government hopes it will bring positive economic growth. Thousands of container ships will use this port, which will change the economic landscape of this region. The government will also connect the Vadhafan port to rail and highway networks. Many local businesses will flourish after this port is built. The port will also help solidify two-way trade with India's regional trading partners, which is seeing a shift in recent years. The world's second largest economy, China, has now overtaken the US as India's largest trading partner. The total two-way trade was valued at a record $118.4 billion in 2023 with India's exports to China rising by 8.7% that year. With economic relations on the rise, trade between the two may now grow to mammoth proportions. Emre Boz, TRT World. Let's get more on this now with Sunil Poshukwale in Birmingham in the UK. He's a professor of international finance at the Cranfield School of Management. Great to have you back on the programme, Professor. Now, what kind of an economic boost is this port expected to have for India? Your report is quite comprehensive and I must compliment TRT for that. Um, it has covered a number of points which I was going to make. Um, Look, I mean, the it, India has now realized that their coastline is um, could be a very strategic source of uh, boosting uh, development and economic growth and trade ties with the rest of the world. Uh, and this is uh, this project is a, a huge project, and it will be the largest uh, port when completed amongst the top ten ports in the in the world, as your report suggests. In terms of economic growth, I mean, it is supposed to generate uh, 1 million plus jobs. Uh, it is also unique in the sense that it is a public-private partnership, also partnership between central and state government. And it is expected that uh, this is going to contribute nearly 1% to the state's uh, economy and will therefore add significantly to the overall economic growth of India. Uh, the trade ties uh, India has uh, with the rest of the world um, will be facilitated through very efficient and, and cost-efficient uh, transportation and the uh, ability to export their products and also import products. Uh, with the um, uh, rest of the world, Central Asia it will connect nicely with Russia, also with India, uh, Middle East, European corridor. So, all in all, it is going to be a significant boost to India's capabilities uh, for doing trade with the rest of the world and therefore add to its economic growth. And India hopes to make this one of the world's top 10 ports and make it a vital corridor between the Middle East and Europe. How will it achieve this? Well, as I said, the, the, the financing, investment uh, ideas of these projects are quite unique in a sense that... Uh, India hasn't really exploited the public-private partnership route. And I think they are beginning to realize that, um, you know, unless they sort of cooperate with the, with the state governments and um, also with private entrepreneurs, uh, big uh, companies and uh, houses who are uh, the capabilities of investing in infrastructure projects, things, things can't move, move further. So... I mean, this will be uh, quite a uh, unique project. Uh, in a sense, uh, it will have automatic handling systems, uh, most sophisticated equipments for efficient transportation uh, of, 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 of uh, movement of goods. And 
you know, it is also going to add to the blue and the green economy of the Indian economy. It is supposed to be one of the uh, most efficient, energy efficient ports uh, in the world. So all in all, I think uh, um, they will, ex you know, they, if, if, if it's completed by 2030, as it is envisaged, this will be a significant boost to India's economic capabilities. All right. So Pashakwali, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much, as always. Thank you. Thank you, as, as always. Thank once considered the backbone of Europe's economy, Germany is now facing mounting challenges. A shrinking GDP and rising unemployment are sparking concerns that the nation's economic health may be faltering. Amar Bakalolo reports. It's been said that Germany is the heart of Europe's economy. But now there are fears that it might be losing its speed. Manufacturing output is down, unemployment is up and consumer confidence is shaken. Germany's economy took a step back in the second quarter of 2024, with the GDP shrinking by 0.1 percent. It was also the only G7 economy to shrink last year, and experts warn of a prolonged slowdown. Taking all of this together, we assume that economic output will remain unchanged in the current quarter and will only increase again slightly in the fourth quarter at the end of the year, according to our estimates, by 0.2 percent compared to the previous quarter. Overall, gross domestic product will therefore stagnate this year. With inflation easing and purchasing power on the rise, one might expect German consumers to open their wallets. But consumption remains muted as households continue to prioritize saving over spending. The savings rate is certainly also a risk. I've told you that consumption is not picking up, even though purchasing power has risen, because households have noticeably increased their savings rate. The forecast assumes that the savings rate will fall again in the course of the coming year, meaning that uncertainty will also disappear and that households and employees will have more confidence that income increases are permanent. Germany's historic reliance on traditional industries like car manufacturing is also under threat. Analysts believe that the country's slow pivot to new technologies has left it vulnerable in key markets. Earlier this week, the Volkswagen Group said it's considering closing factories in Germany for the first time in its 87-year history. I do believe that we probably held on to the combustion engine in Germany for a very long time for political reasons, while the world around us has already changed a lot and has switched to electromobility in development and production, for example. And that is, of course, something that is now causing us problems. That's the point I mentioned earlier. China has basically become a competitor for German products. That doesn't just apply to cars, it also applies to mechanical engineering products. As Germany grapples with stagnation and rising competition, the country once again risks claiming the title of Europe's sick man. Omar Bakalolo, TRT World. Europe's economic powerhouse continues to face challenges. New figures show Germany's trade surplus has hit its lowest level since December 2022, as imports grew more than exports, adding to economic woes. Industrial production dropped more sharply than expected in July, hurt by weaker automotive output. Germany's trade surplus narrowed significantly to around $19 billion in July, down from nearly $23 billion in June, marking a 19-month low. The figure came in well below expectations, signalling further economic strain. Despite the overall downturn, German exports grew by 1.7% month-on-month, reaching $144.3 billion, marking the first increase in three months. Notably, exports to Russia surged by 18.9 percent, but shipments to key markets like the UK, US and China saw declines. Imports surged by 5.4 percent to a three-month high of nearly 125.3 
$5 billion, following a revised 0.2% increase in June. Imports from China rose the most. Meanwhile, Germany's industrial production fell by 2.4% in the same month, much worse than expected. The decline, driven largely by weaker automotive output, contrasts sharply with the 1.7% growth seen the previous month, raising concerns about the country's manufacturing sector. Now joining us from London is economist Steve Keane. He's an honorary professor at UCL. Hi there, Steve. Good to have you on the programme. Now, Germany's GDP has contracted for two consecutive quarters. What are the key drivers behind the slowdown and how does it compare to other G7 economies? Well, the starting point is that Germany, of course, is the home of the belief that the government should run a, not run a, a deficit, should run a surplus in the same way that households should try to, stand, to uh, spend less than they earn. And this is a complete myth. Uh, it means the government doesn't create money because the government creates money by spending more than it uh, takes back in taxation. And that gives the pr private sector debt-free money with which it can invest and spend. So Germany has been strangling itself for the last 40 years by doing this, but compensated by the scale of its export surplus, which was mainly driven by both the undervalued uh, mark, because using the euro, the German effective currency is undervalued, but also by its technological prowess. Now, that that has fallen by the wayside. The decision to uh, ignore the growth of electric vehicles uh, has meant that, in particular, has meant that one of the powerhouses of manufacturing development has fallen over. And now, of course, America initially with Tesla and now China, and especially with BVD, but with so many other companies, is making a mockery of German, German engineering technology. And therefore, that export surplus is evaporating because of the lack of development of German manufacturing capability. So uh, I think that we're finally coming home to roost. 40 years of bad economic policy, trying to run surpluses rather than the deficits which the government should run have been covered by the trade surplus that is now disappearing. Now, you touched on manufacturing. What are the long term um, risks for Germany's traditional sectors uh, like manufacturing, especially in the automotive sector? Well, that's a huge problem because once you fall behind in something like electric cars, you're, you're massively behind unless you can make your own giant leap. And the extent to which Germany is now an also ran in car manufacturing, where they used to be the pinnacle, along with top class Italian sports cars, um, it, it, it's, it's a lost sector. And uh, there's really, I really can't just imagine how Germany can catch up on that front. Uh, they've lost in terms of the manufacturing process itself, and they've lost in terms of the vehicles they're offering, which don't have the correct technology for the modern consumer. So, uh, yeah, uh, having gone through Brandenburg Airport recently, uh, my expectation that Germany is going to be uh, synonymous with high quality manufacturing and good design has gone out the window. And I don't know how Germany is going to ever get out of the slump it's put itself into now. Right, and Germany's trade surplus is now at its lowest in 19 months. How significant is this for the country's economic health? And what does it indicate about the global uh, trade uh, relationships, particularly within the EU? Well, there's three ways you can create money. Banks can lend out more than they take back in repayments. The government can spend more than it gets back in taxation. And the country can export more than it imports. Those three methods all increase the money supply. Uh, because Germany has been rigid about not running government deficits, doing the wrong thing, treating a government like a household, that's one a particular method gone. Banks have saturated themselves after the financial crisis. There is too much private debt. Nobody particularly wants to borrow anymore. So that left just the export surplus. Now that's gone. German money creation is going to be in an all time low. And no country on the planet has grown in real terms, which hasn't also had an increasing money supply. So the loss of the trade surplus, I think, is a huge issue for Germany. OK, Steve Keane, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for your analysis. Welcome. Sunday was the final day for Turkish Technology Festival, Technofest, which hosted competitions for students last week. Young finalists descended on the city of Antalya to present their designs across multiple technological fields. Rupert Stone attended the event and has this report.
The world's largest technology festival wraps up its latest event. From the 5th to the 8th of September, Technofest hosted competitions in the city of Antalya on Turkey's Mediterranean coast. For the last few days, the hall here has been a hive of activity as teams of young contestants competed in various technology competitions. There were more than one and a half million applicants across 49 categories, and the finalists came to Antalya to present their work in 25 separate competitions. The contests covered a wide array of technological domains, from agriculture to cybersecurity, from healthcare and education to flying cars and air defense systems. The event also included training and presentations by major Turkish defense companies and saw the launch of Turkey's big language model, T3 AI. The goal of Technofest was to come up with ideas to make our country fully independent and prosperous. First of all, it was to instill in our society a passion for science and technology. In addition, to help us become more confident in our own abilities. We've been lacking in that respect, particularly in these areas. At least that was the case when I was young. But that's been put right now. We're developing things that will leave their mark on the world, especially with the breakthroughs made in the defense industry. One of the competitions focused on clean energy technology. It involved 80 teams comprising 360 students. Their projects included a liquid that stopped the spread of wildfires and a plastic made from leaves. This student explained an invention that removed pollutants from water. We offer a sustainable and affordable solution for disaster zones where clean water remains scarce. We, as a COVID, also provide a simple and effective uh, way to uh, restore access to um, the most basic need uh, of life, uh, clean water. Technofest will meet again in October in the southern city of Adana. Since its launch in 2018, the festival has convened regularly, even during the pandemic. It is a vital component of Turkey's national technology initiative and a sign of the country's energetic embrace of innovation. Rupert Stone, TRT World, Antalya, Turkey. Well, that's all your business news for now. Thanks for watching.